Exodus 4, 1 through 9. Then Moses answered and said, What if they will not believe me, or listen to what I say? For they may say, The Lord has not appeared to you. And the Lord said to him, What is, it, what is that in your hand? And he said, A staff. Then he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand, that they may believe the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. And the Lord furthermore said to him, Now put your hand in your bosom. So he put his hands into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was a leprous like snow. Then he said, Put your hand into the bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again, and when he took it out of his bosom, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. And it became about that day that if they will not believe you, or heed the witness of the first sign, they may believe the witness of the last sign. But it shall be that if they will not believe even these two signs, or heed what you say, then you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water which you take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Thank you, Tim. I forgot one important thing. You do have to get dressed before you go outside. <laughs> so that's one of those things that happens sometimes. I'm glad to see you here today. What an exciting time we have coming up. I know there's some sign-up sheets out at the Welcome Center for Bible Bowl. That's coming up in March. So March 5th is the time when uh, we're going to be having our Bible Bowl that weekend. And so uh, I know you guys are used to that. We have about 200 kids who come in and are studying the Bible and are willing to compete in that. And, and that's just a great time for them to be able to do some things there. And so, if you can help with that, please sign up on the list, and uh, that would be great to get all of that taken care of, so Brad doesn't have to worry anymore. Uh, everything's going to be done today, so that would be really good. Uh, the other one that's coming up that you may not have heard about yet is Daniel Fenwick is planning a picnic, a barbecue, a time when we're able to get together with our neighbors. And so that's coming up in March as well. It will be March 20th, but he wants to be able to invite everybody to come to that. And so on March the 12th, which is a Saturday, he's going to have a time where we can go out and maybe talk to some people in the park or in the neighborhood or things like that, invite them to come so that maybe we can start some conversations. And then on the 20th of March, we'll all have a big time here and... Uh, be able to eat together and be able to talk with everyone. It's a way to be able to reach out to some people and a way to be able to say, here's who we are. We'd like for you to come be part of us. We want you to know about Jesus. We'll also give you a hot dog just so that you're able to know about these different things. And so that would be a, a good way of introducing and being able to just start a conversation at least. And so that's some of the things that we've got coming up. There's even more than that. But that's enough for right now. So if you go ahead and fill out all the Bible Bowl sign-up lists this week, then when we put out the ones for the picnic next week, then you can take care of those. They're not at the same time, so you'll have time to do all those. All right? We want to be able to do things for Christ. That's one of the things that's most important, be able to put some actions to our belief and some words to those beliefs as well. But I think one of the things we struggle with the most is this idea of doubt. What happens there? Have you ever had doubts? Have you ever, you know, been unsure? Well, I think we look at this situation with Moses, and he's at that time when he's got a little bit of doubt in this. God appears to him, and he says, here's what I want you to do. And he's like, ah, maybe not. Don't think so. It isn't that he started that way. 
it, it, he had this great faith. He understood his role. He knew exactly where he was supposed to be because he had this childhood that was just incredible. I mean, they were actually killing all the babies at that time, and he was the one who was spared. He even got to grow up in the palace. He even got to be there and, and have that education and be trained in all of those things. And so I think that's one of those things that's very, very important to look at. So as you look at the time when he's able to grow up and able to go and able to, to see, well, I'm going to be the next Pharaoh. I've got all of my people. I can certainly deliver them out of slavery. And so he sees himself as that. He understands that. You ever made that deal with God? You know, God, it's you and me. We're going to work together. This is all going to be great. I see what you're doing. I see where I fit in this plan. It's all going to go really good until he decides to go out and check on the people. And as he goes out and checks on the people, he's about 40 years old by this time, and uh, it doesn't go so well. I think you're probably familiar with the story because he finds them arguing and there's a Egyptian who's beating one of his people and you know he kills him he says you're not going to do that and so you know he's protecting he's doing something really important to be able to rescue his people and the next day he goes out again after doing something like that and finds two of the Israelites who are fighting and you know their whole attitude is completely different it's not, oh, thank you for rescuing the guy yesterday. It's, are you going to kill me too because we're fighting? And he realizes they don't believe in him. They don't see that plan. Just because Moses has been living with that idea for 40 years and that he's had that idea and he's seen that and he has this great faith, they don't have it. And they don't really trust him. So let me ask you, did you grow up around church where you were able to have this great faith? You know, a lot of times kids, it's much easier. They believe a lot of things. And as adults, we've grown to know better. I'm not sure that's really good, but that's what happens. We get a little bit more cynical, a little bit more jaded, and we don't quite trust people as much anymore. And so when you get to some of those relationships and when you get to, you know, a little bit more experience in life, you're not really so sure anymore. Moses had actually run away and he went to the land of Midian and he said, I'll just shepherd sheep. It's not going to work. It's never going to be there. And God, I had a wrong idea. And I don't think you'll ever deliver your people. And he does that for 40 years. He walks all over Sinai. And then one day God comes. And the burning bush and God says to him, I'm going to send you back to deliver the people. He's 80 years old now. I'm not sure he believes it anymore. He didn't believe it then. And, you know, after this long of a time, God, it's just, you, you're just kind of too late and so the passage that's been read in Exodus 4, it actually starts before this because, you know, God says, I'm sending you back. And he goes, well, who am I that I should be able to go do that? I mean, maybe at 40, now at 80, I don't feel like I'm able to do that. And then the next question is, well, who are you that, you know, sends me back? And then this question, what if they don't believe me? You ever been in that position where you kind of put your faith in everybody else and nobody else believes you can do it? Nobody else believes you're going to be okay. Nobody else believes that anything good's going to come out of it. You've seen it, you thought it, you believed it, and then nobody else does. I mean, maybe a few people. There's always one or two of those crazy ones that are on your side, right? But they don't know any better. And the majority of the people says, well, I don't know about that. That doesn't sound like a very good idea to me. And so you end up with this kind of a situation where he says, you yeah, know, what if they don't listen to me? 
And I think God's getting a little impatient by this time. And so he comes up with the three miracles that he gives him. And yes, he's going to use the three miracles. Do the three miracles work? No. But Moses, if you want, you know, a little bit more to just to be able to say you can be confident about this, then I'll give you three pretty amazing things. I mean, throws a staff down and it becomes a snake and... I think he's got some faith because God says pick it up by the tail, and he does. I mean, that takes a little bit of faith to grab the rattler end of that thing and that it's going to work. Uh, but it does. And as you look at all of this and try and understand what he's trying to do with faith, I think Moses has gotten to the point where he's kind of lost it. He's lost the dream now. He doesn't really see that it's going to work, and... You know, then he goes, well, I can't really talk well. And then he finally says, well, just, why don't you just send somebody else? And at that point, God starts getting mad. And you don't want to be around God when he starts getting mad. He says, Moses? <laughs> I don't know what Moses' full name was, but, <laughs> you know, when you get that, Moses, 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 or whatever the, the rest of his name was, and, you know, uh oh, okay, maybe I better... We get these great ideas about how things could go. And then if everybody else doesn't go along with us and everybody else doesn't believe it the same, then we kind of get discouraged with it. And I think that's the reason a lot of people leave church today. is because they had an idea. They saw how it could work. They thought, this is going to be great. And then something happened. And it doesn't really matter what the something is. Something happens, and it's not going to quite work out the way that we thought. And so rather than saying, well, there's got to be a better way, God's going to do it anyway, we go, I don't really think it's going to happen. I'm not sure I even believe in God anymore. I'll just go away by myself. And so we go to this place that is our hiding place. Because I think some of the hardest times is when you've tried as hard as you can and you've been disappointed. That's one of the most difficult stages of faith. But when we look at people and they disappoint us, when we look at our leaders and sometimes they disappoint us, when we look at what we thought could work, the plan, and it doesn't work, and that disappoints us, but I want you to realize today that I'm not going to make excuses for everybody. I just want you to know that's going to happen. And so how do you fix that? The main thing is you don't. Because you have to know that's what comes. They didn't believe prophets either, did they? And what happened to those prophets? Well, they spoke against all the things Israel was doing and all the sin that they had, and nobody believed them. At least nobody believed enough to change their actions. And so, well, it was a miserable failure, right? No, you have a whole book full of prophets that spoke for God. And how many of the people that didn't believe are recorded? Only the exceptionally wicked ones, you know. But the prophets are recorded. Their words are written down because they actually spoke. They didn't believe Jesus either. They didn't believe a blind man who had been healed. They said, no, you were never blind. Really? They didn't believe apostles. They didn't believe the followers. They didn't. Uh, why are we surprised when they don't believe us if they didn't believe any of those guys? I, I think you're going to get to that point where it's going to happen to you. But it happens all the time. And I think we just have to know that. I ran across this one illustration. It says, people refuse to believe that for which they don't want to believe in spite of evidence. When explorers first went to Australia, they found a mammal which laid eggs, spent time in the water, some on land, and had a broad, flat tail, webbed feet, and a bill similar to a duck. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, good deal. I can show you the picture. There he is. That's Henry the platypus. 
No, I really don't know what his name is. It says, upon their return to England, they told the populace about this and all felt it was a hoax. And they returned to Australia and they found a pelt from this animal and they took it back to England, but the people still felt it was a hoax. So in spite of the evidence, they disbelieved because they just didn't want to believe. Josh McDowell writes that and he goes, there are just times when people just say, I don't want to believe. If you want to know about these, just ask Becky. She's from there, at least. I don't know if she had one or not. But that's just one of those things that you're able to say, you know, what can you believe? Can you believe in what other people do? Well, we have a lot of incredible things, and I don't know that it's getting any better. I think maybe it's getting a little bit worse. Can you do a handstand on the water? Well, maybe if you Photoshop. No, I think they're holding on to something down there, don't you? Well, I can't do a handstand on the land, much less a handstand on the water, so that looks pretty amazing to me. Do you want to be able to jump down into here? And Is that rock going to hold or not? <laughs> How much faith do you have? Well, I have enough not to jump on that rock. <laughs> because it looks like at any point, time it could give way there you know so there's a lot of those kind of things that are just pretty incredible have you ever watched a bullfight no I haven't either but anyway I don't think this is the way you do it <laughs> so how did he get that bull to stand on his horns I mean the one person was standing on the water and now it's tricks or it's just perfect timing, or it's, you know, we get those. And, but how many believe this? And this isn't even the hard ones. Man, I found some that's just like, they'll never believe that. That's got to be Photoshop. That's just all there is to it. And we know that. It's computer graphics. It's all been done. And we don't believe anything anymore. Not sure that's really helped our case because we don't believe what we see. Picture's worth a thousand words, right? Sure. But I'm not sure we believe the picture anymore because, after all, we end up with things like this. Great picture, right? Can this happen? Can you do this? Can this actually be there? I think we have some incredible things that happen, even with God. And I think we have to be ready to have faith regardless. Because here's what happens as you begin to look just at something that is very, very simple. The resurrection of Jesus. What happened then? How many people believed? In Luke 24, and starting in verse 10, they had gone to the tomb and seen angels. It says, but now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and the other women who, with them who told these things to the apostles, but these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. Well, they'd been there. They had gone to prepare Jesus' body with spices and there's no Jesus there. And so they go and they give them this information. They say, he's not there. And yeah, okay. I don't know if they hadn't believed him before, if it's just at this time, but they don't believe their own people, right? So in Mark 16, 11, and I'm just pulling the ones from the end, Mary Magdalene sees Jesus. It says, but when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. This is the second time. I mean, Mary apparently went back out, saw Jesus, thought he's the gardener, talked to him, comes back, I've seen him now. Uh, we don't believe that. We're still waiting for him to come. A little bit further down in verse 12 and 13. It says, after these things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and they told the rest but they did not believe them. It's the two on the road to Emmaus. 
And so he's going to Emmaus, and it's a seven-mile trek, and, you know, Jesus appears, and Jesus talks to them, and they, they finally figure out, hey, this is Jesus. And they go, run all the way back, and they tell them about it, and, yeah, we don't believe that. These are the guys who are supposed to be talking about the resurrection. These are the guys who have the explanation. It had been told to them. It, it, they have all the doctrine. They have all the teaching. You know, I will rise again in three days. They should know this part. And they're not even believing the people that are part of their own. Last one is John 20. It says, now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hand the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. That's pretty strong, isn't it? And this is the other ten. And one of the 12 is saying, I will not believe. Wow. So I don't want you to be surprised when people don't believe you either. Why wouldn't they believe when they had been taught this? They knew this. They had heard this. They had seen this. This is something that they had been trained in, and it's their own people. It's the own people who had been with them. This isn't some stranger somewhere. This is their own people who are saying, I saw the Lord. You're like, nah, can't be. Well, you know the end of the story. Jesus comes and he appears to Thomas, and Thomas is okay. I mean, that's what he said, is until I can do that, and Jesus is okay, come touch. And he says, yeah, I believe. So what is it that we believe? And are we willing and are we able to deal with the people who say, I don't believe you? Basically, are you willing to take on the preacher's job because you know you're not going to believe what he says on a Sunday morning, right? And you just got to know that going in. But there's a whole group full of people here and there's going to be quite a few walk out and go, yeah, I don't know. At least they don't change their behavior. Does it surprise you that that's what faith requires? Is that you go beyond all the people around you that doubt. That you go beyond all the friends and relatives that doubt. That you go beyond all the other church people sitting on the pew next to you that doubt. And there's one more. That you go beyond the elders and the other preachers in the congregation that doubt. Because that's who that is. Thomas is saying, I'm one of the ministers in this new group, and I don't believe you. That's pretty incredible. That's a lot of, we're not going to believe you. So what do we do about that? You're going to do it anyway. See, that wasn't such a hard answer, was it? Because you're not going to fix it. You're not going to fix all the people who don't believe. I just want you to be aware that it has happened to every other person in the world. It's not you. It's not anything against you. It's just the way we are. For some reason, we don't believe it until someone actually goes and does it. And so let's just go do it. And I think that's what it's got to come down to is this whole thing of faith is let's act like it really does matter, like it really makes a change, like it is really there. So let me give you an easy one for you to practice on, okay? James chapter 1 and verses 5 through 8, another familiar passage. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. It will be given him. And let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. 
it's kind of one of those good news, bad news passages. He says, if you lack wisdom, ask God and he'll give it to you. And then he says, but you better not doubt. But that's an incredible promise. If you don't have wisdom, you can ask God and he will give it to you, right? That's a pretty good promise. Now, he may just, you know, open the top of your head and pour it in. I've always liked that kind of idea. You know, let's do it that way. Just dump it on me, Lord. I'm ready. You know, make me smart. It hasn't really worked that way. More often what happens, if you're going to give me wisdom, then you're going to put me in difficult situations where I'm going to figure out something. And he says, okay, now use that. But if you want wisdom, he's got it, and he's willing to give it to you. Do you believe that is the whole question? Do you believe he will actually do that? Uh, yes. Really? <laughs> Even if everybody else around you says you're not that smart. Even if everybody else around you treats you like you don't have any wisdom. Can you, the next time that situation comes up, the next time something is required of you, say, you know what? I ask God for wisdom. I believe it's here. Because that's the other part of this thing. You know, you'd, you'd like to get a certificate or something. You know, Terry has wisdom. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be great? I could show it to you. Hey, look, I've got the certificate. At least some kind of a tingly feeling or something that goes... You know, well, yeah, I've got this wisdom. It just, just kind of tingles all over me, that type thing, and says, "Woo, here we are. I got it. Not as much as Ken gets, you know, but, <laughs> you know, just a, wisdom doesn't quite go that far. But it, you get some of the idea of what I, I would like, some kind of a feeling, some kind of a proof, some kind of a confidence. And he, he's saying, no, I just want you to believe it. <laughs> really? but I haven't ever felt smart before. I haven't ever felt wise before. He says, I know, I just want you to believe it. Well, how would you test this to see if you actually got it or not? It's pretty easy, really. Just the next time it comes up where you need it, then you just decide what I know is wise. And I'm not afraid to do it, and I'm not afraid to say it. Because I ask God's going to give it to me or God's going to teach me. And there it's going to be. And God, I believe that 100%. It will be there because you said it would be there. And there's absolutely no doubt. And that's the hard part, isn't it? Because you know how many mistakes we've made before. Can you get wisdom from God? Can you get some wisdom in your life that's going to make things different? Do we have faith in the first place? Because there's a whole lot of other people going to tease you about it and say, well, no, that's not too smart. Just do it and show them. And sometimes that's the only way to be able to do that. And that's what's going to make all the difference. Don't worry about other people who may not believe you because you've got a promise and you're going to believe in the promise of God. And there's a lot of those promises that God is able to give. We have a promise that we could be forgiven. Do you believe that one? Does everybody else treat you like that one's okay? Like I've asked God and he's forgiven me. Or do they treat you like you're still guilty? I'd venture to say a lot of them will treat you like you're still guilty. Like you're the one that's not forgiven. It makes you doubt yourself. No, I've got a promise from God. He said that. I believe that that's there. He promised that you would have eternal life to everyone who repents and is baptized into him and has that Holy Spirit and is able to. Do you believe that promise? Do you act with no doubt that God has been able to cleanse you of every single sin that you have and you don't have guilt today? Because he has taken that all away. And besides that, he's going to give you wisdom because you're going to ask for that. Because you're going to need it in order to do his work. You're going to need it in order to do his will. Whatever you ask in prayer, believe you have received it. And it will be yours.
So maybe you need to ask about the repentance. Maybe you need to ask about the forgiveness and surrender your life to God. We're here to help you ask. Would you come while we stand and sing? Lord, I need restored. My heart is weak.